When I was a child, somebody in my family gave me this darling little plaque, and it had my name on it, and then it had the meaning of my name. It, it looked just like this, and it was this framed print, and, and, I, and it said meaning industrious, and I didn't know what that meant. And so I went and looked it up in my classic Webster's dictionary, and this is what it said, constantly, regularly, or habitually active. <laughs> and I was like, that's why I have so much energy. This is why everybody is always telling me to quiet down, calm down, lay down, sit down. You know, industriousness is something that our world really appreciates because it gets, things get done. And, and, but do we appreciate the opposite? What do we call people that aren't industrious? Lazy, lazy, procrastinators, teenagers. <laughs> if you know me, I am an Enneagram 3. If you know the Myers-Briggs, I am an ENTJ, very strong E, very strong J. And so you know that I am indeed industrious. And so which one does God like most? Who makes the NHS, the National Heavenly Society? Is it the industrious one? Or is it the non-industrious one? Like Jesus does over and over in the Gospels, he is going to challenge us on what we think is the right answer to that. So as we prepare to hear our Gospel reading for the day, will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you for your spirit that unifies us. Thank you for your spirit that comforts us. And thank you for your spirit that teaches us. So, O oh Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. In Christ's name, amen. Here's from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is speaking and he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. When he w went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and he found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received a denarius. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says a lot of stories and parables like this where the audience is left to say, hmm, I don't really understand that. He says a lot of peculiar things. In one instance, he says, unless you change, and he's talking to adults, unless you change and become like children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And then in another instance, he says, you must be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. And so then I tell you, go take all of your possessions and sell them and take that money and give that money to the poor. So while we may be stumped at this parable, this was Jesus' normal way of teaching. 
With each teaching, he would take a truth, something that the audience would lean in and go, I know what's going to happen, I know what's going to happen, and then he would flip it. He turned it upside down. He changed the outcome we all expected because we have been trained that when you work hard, you get more. The more you put in, the more you get out. The longer you stay, the more reward you get. This is not at all what's happening in this parable. So I want you to look back at the text with me. Look at this, this first verse. The landowner needed laborers and went to find them. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. The first laborers that were hired by the landowner, they made an agreement. It doesn't say they fussed. They weren't upset that they weren't getting paid enough. They agreed. They were grateful. We have a denarius. A denarius would have been enough food for a family for about five days. This would have been fantastic. Let's go toil for the day, and we have been given enough for our family. They weren't forced to go. They agreed. And then look back at the next text. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. You know, we're never told, why did he have to go back so many times? Did he, is he that bad of a judge of how much he needed laborers there? No. There is no mention that he misjudged the number of workers needed. All we are told is that he kept going back and back and back and saying, do you want to work? What's tripped me up, and I'm assuming has tripped you up, is that that word idle is in there. And we get this image of like these people like chilling out, smoking a cigarette with a cup of coffee in one hand, just enjoying the day. But that's not what the Greek word means. The Greek word for idle, it means they were without work. They wanted to work and no one had hired them. These are not lazy people, but rather people who could not find an employment. And then when these workers are hired, did you notice what the text says? The landowner says, I will pay you what is right. And the Greek word that's used there, it means what is just. What is the right amount? What is enough? What will help you to get by? And the landowner does this again two more times in the same way. And all of this, it seems so industrious. He's getting all the work done. He's get, everybody's going to put in all of their work and he's going to have it done. It's like he's going to have this project done in what day and in one day and all of them are going to be paid what is right. And that's where we get in trouble because we assume that right means what they earned or how hard they worked. I assumed that the workers who were still in the marketplace, they somehow chose not to work. Like they came late because they slept in or something. But friends, all of these workers are the same and all of them are day laborers who do not have a job to go to. So what if there is another teaching in this parable? What if the point is not about the amount given to each of these workers? Nor is it even how hard each worker worked but the intent and the purpose of the giver. The giver just wanting to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to have dignified work before them. Jesus flips the ending that we all assumed. The right wage had nothing to do with what one earned, but rather what was enough. What was enough for each human being to live on. What if this parable about how in the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of people, how in the kingdom of God what matters is not how much one earns or how hardworking or lazy one is. What matters is that all people get enough. The ones who worked all day, they get enough. 
The ones who win at half day, they get enough. The ones who win at the end of the day, they get enough. When I lived in Atlanta, on my commute to work, I would pass this, this parking lot, a big lots parking lot, and in the morning, it would be filled with day laborers. And I used to be super judgy of them. I'm still judgy, but I was specifically judgy of them. And when I would go back at lunchtime, there would still be some people there, and I thought, oh, they must have not gotten there early enough. And so I was expressing this to a colleague of mine, and she said, you know, let's get to know them. It's really cold during the winters here in Atlanta, so why don't we go a couple days a week and just bring them coffee? And so we started doing that in January one year. And so we got to know these day workers, and we got to know also the system that they were laboring under. And so what would happen is, is that a truck would pull up sometime around seven, the first truck, and, and the man would put his hand out the window and he would say, quattro. Y'all, there's 60 people there looking for work. Whoever were the fastest to get to that truck got that first job. And then an, an more time would pass and someone else would come in and say, Ocho, and then they would get in. And then you would see people that had, were arriving late would be running from the bus stop, just desperate to get work. Well, there was never enough trucks that pulled up. There was always people that were just waiting for someone to hire them. And one guy, he, he was so upset, he said, I'm only late because I had to get, I was the one that had to get my kids on the bus today because my wife is sick. He hadn't slept in. He didn't even have a car to get himself there. These are human beings. And I think our God is so concerned with everybody's flourishing. And we, friends, we have access to so many things. We are born into privilege. Very few of us have ever skipped a meal because there was nothing in the pantry. Very few of us have ever had to worry about a clothing piece on our back. And even if we did, we would have had the privilege of family and friends and a faith community like this who would have come and helped us. And so this presents a new question for us. What type of landowner are we? Amy Jill Levine, she's a Jewish Christian scholar, and this is what she says of this parable. Jesus is neither a Marxist nor a capitalist. Rather, Jesus is an idealist and a pragmatist, his focus is often less directly on good news to the poor and more on the responsibility of the rich. In this parable, the last hired benefits from the contract made with their coworkers early that morning. They benefit from an employer who pays a just wage to those who labor. They benefit from an employer who is generous with his money. Thus. Not only do the householder and laborer need each other, the work of some laborers benefits the lives of others. In the end, all have enough to eat. And the rich recognize their responsibility to those who are less well off, a responsibility that includes not just giving a handout, but hiring workers who can thus preserve their dignity. The parable begins in this way. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. There is never any mention of what type or level of harvest he had because that's not what it's about. In God's kingdom, there's always enough. There's always work. Everybody is always allowed to come and join in. The God of scripture, Genesis to Revelation, wants people to flourish. There is never once where it is okay for someone to be starving or to be without community. God of Scripture wants all people to have enough to eat, enough people to have enough to drink, enough people, enough to have healthy lifestyle. And as followers of Jesus, we have been entrusted to share this kingdom, this kingdom of God with the world. God depends on us to do that. And y'all, our smiles and our hugs and our, our sweet talk, it is so awesome and so wonderful, but this text says we have been given a responsibility to do something with our money, with our privilege, our resources, to literally be on the lookout like that landowner who, 
Who struggles with their dignity because they, they do not have meaningful employment? Who is struggling with their dignity because they, they are broken and, and an addict and they've lost all of their relationships? Who, is struggl- who is, struggles with their dignity because they are imprisoned, literally? We have been given a responsibility for those that do not have enough because they have no family left, and even for those who don't show up till 5 p.m. May it be so in my life and in yours. Amen.